Welcome one and all to another day here at the Damage Board. I'm John Arola, very lucky to be joined by Ida Rodriguez. Ida, how's it going? It's going well, John. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, I've been I've been a little bit uh, on a hiatus, so you know, for me to get on this, you mean the world to me because I am you. staying away from everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we have tried to put together a rundown of stories. I mean, look, some of it we're obligated to talk about some important stuff. We also try to choose a few things that I think would be up your alley, and and I hope you enjoy it. Um, just a little quick behind the scenes thing. So we have recently on the show switched over to using Zoom as opposed to Skype. Uh, and our team has been like desperately trying to fix this issue where we can't hear the like intro song, which is what pumps me up or whatever. And I feel like every time they try to fix it, we get less of the audio. <laughs> <laughs> so that time I didn't hear a single beat and I know that they're working so hard to fix it. But anyway, technology is a hell of a thing. We were talking before the show about social media and all that and it just, I don't know, I feel like it's getting to be where you gotta just go live in the woods. Like <laughs> technology's not helping anybody, nobody can figure it out and the worst people are in control of it. So that's the world we live in. But anyway, very glad to have you here as we launch into all this news. In just the next 15, 20 minutes or so, we're to take stock of the GOP primary. Some of the insane self, like cell phones going on there. Uh, the changing fortunes for Lauren Bober. What what is in store for her political future? I think this is awesome. And uh, we've got some absolutely ridiculous uh, police officer body cam footage. Um, thankfully, not showing them utterly brutalizing someone, but instead just being willing tools in this bizarre, censorious culture war that the right is perpetrating against many different groups, but particularly the LGBTQ community. So there's a lot that we're going to be talking about in just the first hour, let alone the aftermath. Uh, Donald Trump uh, has heard people spreading stories about him about Home Alone 2, and he's not gonna stand for it anymore. And so he's gonna correct the record on his interactions with Kevin McAllister, that's coming up in the aftermath. In advance of all that, please hit the like button, share the stream so that people know we're live, they can hang out with us, join in the conversation. And if you wanna send us comments, tweets, super chats, we'll respond as we go. And you might earn yourself a $100 Blue Apron gift card. So definitely look into that. But with all that said, Heidi, you ready to do this thing? I am, and I'll, I'll hype you up, go John, go John. I think I'm ready. Let's do this. Okay. <laughs> well, to get us started, uh, with less than two weeks until the first GOP primary contest, let's check in with the contenders. I'm not. I'm not a candidate. You want me to work that for you? <laughs> <laughs> As my kids would say, that's my jam. Nikki Haley is on the rise, closing in on Donald Trump in New Hampshire. And she did a town hall there. She needs this win. And she was asked a question that should be the easiest layup in history. And she decided to go in a different direction. Take a look at this. Um, what was the cause of the United States Civil War? Well, don't come with an easy question or anything. I mean, I think the cause of the Civil War was basically how government was going to run. The freedoms and what people could and couldn't do. What do you think the cause of the Civil War was? I'm sorry? I'm not president. I want to see your view on the cause of the Civil War. I mean, I think it always comes down to the role of government. We need to have capitalism. We need to have economic freedom. We need to make sure that we do all things so that individuals have the liberties, so that they can have freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom to do or be anything they want to be without government getting in the way. What do you want me to say about slavery? Next question. That was terrible. Now, look, we decided to keep in those weird, awkward pauses because it's important that you know that there were those weird, awkward pauses. Her init, she was asked the question initially, what caused the Civil War? And she like pauses, walks backward, makes a joke about being asked tough questions, gives a horrible response. And when you ask for a follow up, and he even prompts her, like, hey, maybe you should mention the slavery thing. She, like the look on her face, Ida, what do you want me to say about slavery? 
I don't know, anything, literally anything about how that was kind of a big part of the whole thing. It was so utterly defensive. And we're gonna show you in a little bit her attempt to sort of like backtrack or fix the situation that she's found herself in after the criticism from that first video. But when we eventually get that, I do want you to remember how defensive she was in the initial thing. This was not a case of Nikki Haley like like mind farting and like, oh, well, obviously slavery. Sorry, I forgot to mention that specifically. No, she was angry when it was brought up. So we'll get to that in a bit. But Ida, I wanted your thoughts about Nikki Haley utterly flubbing that incredibly simple question. I mean, the whoever put the package together put it put it perfectly. The pick me candidates. Um, listen, I I'm so tired of these people. Well, I'm just, it's just, I don't even know what can be said anymore because I feel like all we do is just preach to the choir over and over again. But I do understand why the Black American community gets frustrated with people of color because Nikki Haley is a woman who is technically what? Part Indian? She's part South Asian. Uh, and yes, yes. to say, Sit here, you, and, and it, there's this back and forth that a lot of people of color do. They jump in with Black Americans, like, "Hey, we are all people of color." Then, in, when there's a a moment where they are, and not all of them, but many of them, when they feel like they can get patted on the head by the white people who hate people of color, they're like, "Yeah, what do you mean? What do you want me to say about slavery?" I really want to curse right now. We want to acknowledge that it existed. We want to talk about the impact that it's had on this country and is still having on this country. The economic imbalance that occurs in this country between white people and people of color. One of the greatest contributors to white privilege and white people walk around this country mistreating and dehumanizing people of color. And and, and if you don't even want to talk about the human the humane aspect of it, you could at least touch about you talking about economics and government and freedom. How about freedom, period? That people human, <laughs> human beings were deserving of freedom. And it is just, you know, it is so um indicative of how dumb uh, these politicians think Americans really are because they don't really feel like they have to answer questions anymore. And the way they answer questions now are the way that people who dropped out of school, who didn't even get basic education, K through 12 education answer it. And these are the people that want to run, not just the government, but they want to manage our funds, the funds that we work for. And people, yeah. we have to be judicious about who we employ and put in these positions. Yeah, look, I think I think there's definitely a lot of people like that. I would say with Nikki Haley, it might even be something worse though, because Nikki Haley is a perfectly intelligent person. Of course, she knows what the Civil War was about. So it would be ignorance would be terrible, but willful pretend performative ignorance seems worse because it says so much about what she thinks needs to be done to win, what she thinks of the people that she's trying to get to vote for. And bear in mind. She's trying to be the alternative to Trump. She's trying to be the more traditional Republican, the more respectable, serious Republican. And yet still, she is like bristling at the idea that you might make her acknowledge the role of slavery in the Civil War. And as I said, we're gonna get to her follow up video. But you should also know that she appeared on the Jack Heath show. And she uh, she was complaining about the Democrats and Joe Biden, quote, sending plants to her town hall. Why are they hitting me? See this for what it is. They want to run against Trump. In town halls, I answer every question, and they are planting questions there. She says it was definitely a Democrat plant. Okay, uh, first of all, was it? No, almost certainly it was not. But let's say that it was. Let's say Joe Biden had told that dude, head to the Nikki Haley town hall, and ask her a gotcha question about what the cause of the Civil War was. You know how you diffuse that? You say slavery. Why is that difficult? That's not that's not by its very nature a like a gotcha question. You're admitting that you think based on your situation, your context, it's a gotcha. Because how dare you make me acknowledge the obvious role of slavery in the Civil War? It's only a gotcha because of where you've decided to place yourself. In our politics, appealing to racists who don't want you to acknowledge that slavery um, existed, that that was uh, obviously the driving force behind the Civil War. And 
And so that's how she's trying to do some like, uh, I guess, damage control or whatever. Well, let's uh, let's move to her attempt to explain why she answered in the way that she did. Take a look at this. Last night I was asked about the Civil War and what I think of the Civil War, what was the cause of the Civil War. Of course, the Civil War was about slavery. We know that. That's unquestioned, always the case. We know the Civil War was about slavery. But it was also more than that. It was about the freedoms of every individual. It was about the role of government. The lessons of what that bigger issue with the Civil War is that let's not forget what came out of that, which is government's role, individual liberties, freedom for every single person, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom to do and be anything you want to be without anyone or government getting in your way. That should be the goal of what we always try and take away from that, right? Uh, no, that's a horrible, horrible response. First of all, you did not say slavery last night and then move on to talk about other things. You skipped it, you went to those other things. So don't try to pretend that it was so obvious you didn't need to mention it and then got angry when the guy brought it up. So that's absolute BS. And then her attempt to be like, no, 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 <laughs> you guys are in the mud. I care about philosophy. What came out of it was respect for the rights of everyone, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. No, 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 no. Like we're talking about like 80, 90 years after the Bill of Rights. That stuff already existed for a whole bunch of people. Now we're focusing on will it actually apply to black people in America, to those who are being held as slaves in America. Eventually, we might get around to should women be able to vote? And of course, they didn't want rights for gay and trans people as well. That's a part of the culture war that she's still eagerly a part of. So trying to like throw it to, no, we're just talking about general concepts of freedom and speech and all that. That is not what was being decided. You can say that that's what the Revolutionary War was about, perhaps. That we can have a conversation. But this was very specifically not about government's role, but government's role in regulating whether you can hold humans as property, whether humans can be treated like they're shovels or rakes or something. That's what it was actually about. You know that, and more importantly, you know the sort of people that you desperately need to vote for you in southern states. And I don't need to tell you what those people think about race in America. You're telling all of us what you think those people think about race in America. It's, and by the way, we're gonna go to a little bit more of her history because she's cloaking how bad she's been on this topic for a very long time. But I don't wanna give you a chance to jump in. I just think it's uh, hilarious while well, she stands there with her ski sweater on, <laughs> such an, <laughs> in her elite, in her, uh, her eliteness and sits there and says, of course it is as if it is something that's as a matter of fact, we all know about this, but the fact that she said that, you know, <laughs> the self determination of people that have been dehuman dehumanized, any race, the erasure of slavery is what is really so obnoxious about her. But it's, and, and when I said about the education, I'm, I'm talking about who she's talking to. And mm -hmm. the fact that, that nobody insults that base more than the people who want them to be to support them. You hear all of the stuff that they say to the red wing, the right wingers, the Republican people, they insult their intelligence on a daily basis. They expect them not to know, not to have the information. They stoke their hate. They're like, listen, if we talk about the immigrants, if we talk about black people, if we talk about crime, we talk about people trying to take away their stuff. They're gonna stay too angry. They're not gonna learn the real information and we can continue to manipulate them and we can continue to drive them in the direction that we want to drive them. That is not how they say it blatantly, but that is certainly the context. And many of us who are fluent in context understand what's happening here. So shame on you if you allow these people to play with your feelings and play in your face while you don't have health care, you don't have a, a, a good books at the school for your children, you don't feel safe where you go, and they take their your money and look what she she's telling you how much of a lavish life she's living while she's talking mm -hmm. to American people with her ski sweater on when the average American person cannot even afford a gym membership. So yeah. I just think it's so interesting to me that these people want to follow. It's idolizing. It has nothing to do with politics. It's idolatry at this point. And it's very sad because it has driven this country into being the toilet bowl that it is. 
Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and, and as you said, it is so like they, they have no respect for their own base. I understand, yeah. like we're you know we're the libs or whatever. So like we always look down on these people. Oh, okay, that's fine. You can make that case, but we're not the ones trying to get those people to vote for us. The people who they're trying to get to vote for them are the ones who are utterly disrespecting them. By the way, we're gonna talk later on the show about Chris Matthews and about people disrespecting rural voters. This is what true disrespect is like. It's someone like Nikki Haley who knows better and thinks these people are too stupid to accept what actually happened. So racist that they'll never evolve and I don't care. Like they're the ones I say I love. But I'm not going to try to help them to understand what really happened in America. Now, really fast, I just want to show you, like, this is not just she slipped up in this forum and now she's sort of repairing it. She has been awful in this area in the exact same way for well over a decade. Here is Nikki Haley in a video back from 2010. What's your belief about the reason the Civil War was lost? I mean, again, I think that as we look in government, as we watch government, you have different sides. And I think that you see passions on different sides. And I don't think anyone does anything out of hate. I think what they do is they do things out of tradition and out of beliefs of what they believe is right. Um, I think you had one side of the Civil War that was fighting for tradition, and I think you had another side of the Civil War that was fighting for change. You know, at the end of the day, what I think we need to remember is um, that, you know, Everyone is supposed to have their rights. Everyone's supposed to be free. Everyone's supposed to have the same um, freedoms as anyone else. So, you know, I think it was tradition versus change is the way I see it. Tradition versus change on what? On individual rights and liberty of people. That is so terrible. It's um tradition yeah yeah that's the t- tradition and um change for that tradition is this vague enough and then the guy presses yeah what which tradition which exact tradition were they fighting for of uh, freedoms in a general sense something philosophical no this is not it's so obvious i don't need to mention it's It's so obvious that if I mention it, it's gonna hurt me politically. So I'm gonna pretend not to understand that slavery was a thing. That's who she actually is and still is. It is important to note that she is she was that way, you know, five years before Donald Trump came down that escalator. And she's still saying the same sort of stuff. And she's the person who's supposed to be the like respectable, responsible, serious politician alternative to Donald Trump. She is on topics like this just as garbage as he is, doing the exact opposite of telling it like it is, telling it like I desperately need to pretend that it is. I I feel the fact that she said, you know, when she talked about tradition and beliefs, she's indirectly supporting that that as Americans, some people have the right to believe that other people in America are less than human. <laughs> and it's it's this, you know, it's this like silent call to the and this the silent whistle to fellow racist and anti-black people when you hear that kind of that kind of talk. And it's like, well, that was the belief system of the time, and that was what people believed. That doesn't make it right. There were a lot of people who didn't believe that that was right, that were not black people. The fact that that was that you made it an enterprise and you made it a profitable business and that so many of you people who have benefited from it are still benefiting from it to this day. And some people who who are suffering from it are still suffering from it this day. It's just appalling. And I don't think we should just be, you know, cool about this type of stuff because this This is bleeding into the country and it is causing far more Mm. problems. And the abuse of black people in this country continues. It is so disgusting, man. I hope, I I don't know, I don't even know what to hope for anymore at this point. It is, it really feels just hopeless when you think about the hands Mm. that this country is in. I think, I I don't think that it's hopeless at any given time an asteroid could hit Earth. I mean, Uh any (laughs) moment that could happen. So, yeah, um, but the last thing I want to say about this before we move on to Chris Christie, we'll we'll save Laura Loomer for another day for time. But um, it's this weird thing with like like poor conservatives get caught up and and believe. 
that they're part of this movement that is like anti elite. It's this populist thing. We're against the elites. How dare you elites talk down to us? Meanwhile, we love New York billionaire Donald Trump and oh, Elon Musk is great too. He's literally the richest man in the world. But that is not just a new thing where they worship those politicians and they worship hosts on Fox, every one of whom is a millionaire. It has been going on forever. They they still talk with these worshipful terms effectively in defending the slave owners. The, the slave owners were so rich and owned so much that they owned people. And they're yep. still like 150 years later, they're fighting for how awesome those people were and how dare you be mean to them. They don't care that these slave owners took tons of poor Southerners and threw them into a meat grinder so that they could keep owning other people as property. And the propaganda was so effective that we're gonna go centuries before they finally move on from trying to rewrite the history of that. I don't understand how they don't understand how they're being played by the rich and have been for generations upon generations. Anyway, let's move on to Chris Christie. Uh, Chris Christie still in the race, and he's not going anywhere for at least a little bit. He reminds us in this new ad. Some people say I should drop out of this race. Really? I'm the only one saying Donald Trump is a liar. He pits Americans against each other. His Christmas message to anyone who disagrees with him, rotten hell. He caused a riot on Capitol Hill, he'll burn America to the ground to help himself. Every Republican leader says that in private. I'm the only one saying it in public. What kind of president do we want? A liar or someone who's got the guts to tell the truth? New Hampshire, it's up to you. So that is Chris Christie making his big appeal in New Hampshire. This is a seven figure ad campaign. That ad is debuting today in New Hampshire. He really needs to outperform in New Hampshire, one would assume, to maintain his candidacy. And you can see that as of relatively recent polling, he was at about 13% in New Hampshire. We'll see how he ends up doing. He previously told the messenger earlier this month that he has for New Hampshire and Iowa voting thresholds that he needs to at least match to continue. Now, he will not say what those are. But he does say that um, you know that's for me to know. And believe me, you'll see me react to it. It's not like you don't know what I'll do. In 2016, I didn't get to the number I wanted to, and I dropped out the next day. But I don't think that's gonna happen. I feel it when I'm out there interacting with voters. I think that Chris Christie, for his newfound willingness to criticize Donald Trump in very clear terms, um, is at least in that way the best of all the Republicans. But he's also completely playing himself. If he believes that the Republican Party base is going to choose him, they're simply not going to. It could have happened, but there's been no movement seemingly over the last year. They don't want someone who's attacking Donald Trump. Very clearly, very few of them want that at the very least. So I don't know that he's going to be around for much longer. And I have a question for you. If he wants Trump to be beaten, and it seems fairly clear that he's not going to be the one to do it. Should he drop out and try to get his supporters to move over to ugh, like Ron DeSantis or Nikki Haley, who we've been talking a lot about? What do you think? Um, I want them to fail, so I won't. I won't even suggest anything for them to win. Um, but I will say this: if he was really gangster, he wouldn't have said uh, Donald Trump caused a riot on Capitol Hill. He would have said he was part of an insurrection that tried to overthrow the government of the United States. That's yeah. the gangster, not uh, he caused a riot at that. They caused a riot at in, inter university here when their game, uh, their team lost. What happened at Capitol Hill was uh, officers lost their lives. People were beaten and women, a woman died and they tried to overthrow the government and Donald Trump sent them up there and then took a ride home and let them go ahead and cause all this damage and try to overthrow the government. They were trying to kill Nancy Pelosi. They tried to do major yeah. damage uh, and overthrow our government. And you want to call it a little riot? You're not as gangster as we thought, as, we, as you think you are. And why won't you talk about 
you're not a punk anymore because Donald Trump did punk you. Why don't you talk about that? That would make me say, okay, now he's really coming through. But he's not. He's not. What he is is he's tra- he's talking to the people that he thinks will listen, and they don't respect him because he won't even address how Donald Trump treated him. Mm-hmm. And and that's what makes people not respect him because there was a moment where he was licking his boots, right? I um, there was several years of moments. Of him licking his boots. And look, I I prefer that someone eventually turn away from that. I just would respect it more if it had happened way earlier than it did. Um, but and that why? said, yeah, he he is pulling his punches in the way that you're saying. Um, but also, like that there there are some Republicans who don't want Trump. Clearly, he's at 13%. Nikki Haley's getting some support. That just is not the majority of the party. And I don't know how you get it to be the majority of the party. Clearly, they need to work on their base, but they haven't been willing to do that because to do that, you'd have to criticize Trump. And there's only been a few people occasionally who've been willing to do that. If you wanted to turn the party around, all of them needed to be doing this for years, and they're not willing to do that. So I don't know how they recover their party at this point. I'll give final thoughts. But also saying, uh, I just, uh, the reason I'm harping on the term he caused a riot is because he doesn't want to upset the people who supported that, right? He doesn't want to upset because if he, if he uses the language that is the correct language to use for what happened on January 6th, he would, he would upset the people who were in in support of it because they hate our government. And so that's why I'm saying it's, it's not even, even if you were, opposed to this and you're looking for those people, then you would be direct about what what is happening so that you can can be a part of waking up that 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 sector of the country that needs to that needs the awakening to try to preserve our democracy. But that's not what he's doing. So why should we trust him and why should we even respect him? Well, you won't have to for much longer because I would anticipate he won't be in this thing for more than like six weeks. But we'll see. We'll see. Anyway, we're going to take our first break. We come back, a little update on what's going on with Lauren Boebert these days after this. If you're just joining us now, please hit the like button. We're going to jump into more news. Today, I am announcing my candidacy for the 2024 Republican nomination to represent Colorado's fourth congressional district in the United States House of Representatives. It's the right move for me personally, and it's the right decision for those who support our conservative movement. Is it clear what she's doing there? She's running for re-election, as we expected, but not where we might expect because that's not her district at all. It's a totally different district, uh, but one that Lauren Boebert clearly thinks that she has a better chance of winning in. So she is fleeing her district. And I love her her explanation. First of all, she tried to do like the faux gravitas or whatever. She said it's the right decision for me. Well, yeah, I have no doubt that you have a better shot and you are focusing on yourself. So I'm glad that you put that first in your list of priorities. And then she also said it's the right people for like those who are supporting our movement. No mention of the constituents, not even the people of Colorado. It's her and then people who support our movement around the country. Like they don't even have to pretend that they give a damn about their actual district or the people who live in it. That's not where they raise their money. It's not who they spend their time with. And even when they flee, they like inside of their own state carpet bag to a different place. They don't even have to pretend that that's who they care about. Well, um, she's getting a lot of criticism. So I'm sure she will focus more on that. But get, let's give her a little bit more time to talk about why she is leaving her district for uh, greener pastures. I promised I would do whatever it takes to stop the socialists and communists from taking over our country. That means staying in the fight, but it also means not allowing Hollywood elites and progressive money groups to buy the third district, a seat that they have no business owning. I will not allow dark money that is directed at destroying me personally to steal this seat. It's not fair to the third district and the conservatives there who have fought so hard for our victories, of which I'm incredibly grateful. Yeah, keep that forced smile on your face and pretend that you're not terrified of losing uh, your reelection bid. That's why she left. She was super close last time around and she believed that Adam Frisch was gonna beat her in a reelection. That's all that this is. The thing about I'm not gonna let dark money buy the election, she raises money from all over the country. Like utterly ridiculous. What, so now that you're going to this other one, the dark money isn't gonna flood into that district? 
Again, it's all it's all BS. Like her talking about that this is a big sacrifice. I said I'd take out the communists and the socialists, and now I'm gonna do it over there where I might be able to win re-election. This is all personal. It's ridiculous that you can do this. She doesn't live there. That's not her district. She doesn't know anything about it. And it's entirely possible, by the way, considering that there's already a packed Republican primary there. Ken Buck, who previously held the seat, is not gonna be running for election. So a bunch of Republicans are flooding in. This should turn off a lot of Republicans in that area. It might well do that. So we'll see if this works for her. It is a much safer seat though. So her previous district was R plus seven. Remember, she massively underperformed what you would expect from that area for Republican. The district she's moving into is about twice as Republican, R plus 13. So she has a better shot, but she has to make her way through the Republican primary first. Ida, what do you think about this? You know, it's a scary place that the more despicable these people behave, the more traction they gain. Um, this is the woman that got kicked out of a movie theater for being inappropriate and uh, right in a physical altercation. Yes. Like with Beetlejuice. Her, with, <laughs> with her, is it boyfriend? Is that what it was? Because she's getting yes. a divorce because she, you know, whatever. You know, this is the people People who are always talking about values and the people who are always talking about moral conduct and the people who are always talking about uh, pointing out other people's behaviors that commit some of the most ridiculous, despicable behaviors that feel the audacity that they should be in charge of uh, people's money and participating in lawmaking and maintaining order in the country, in the country, which I feel is just so hypocritical and so ridiculous. But also the fact that people don't respect our government anymore, our process and and the rules. And, you know, there are people of color that go to jail for sending their kids to a different district. Mm -hmm. There are mothers in jail who have gone to jail because they went, they wanted their kids to go to a better school. But here, this woman can just switch the district that she wants to run to, wants to run in where she doesn't live, and everybody's all right with this. And I just think that this is, it's just ridiculous. It is ridiculous. There are so many women who have worked so hard that I guarantee you they are, they're in droves that could do a much better job in government. And these are the people that get elected. And it is so sad that they are the representation of women when women have to fight so hard for everything that we get and still be underpaid. And yeah. this is what they choose to elevate, you know, these ridiculous women who are doing and and, and listen, the men know better cuz I I'm I'm all here for power to the woman, but I just feel that this woman has been so harmful. The woman who wanted to take arms into Congress, the woman who has a physical altercation and has to get kicked out of an establishment is the one you want to elect into office and tell your children these are the heroes and these are the people to look up to. 100%. I don't, I don't know what to say. Yeah, like there's, there's hundreds of thousands of people living in the area. There's nobody who's better qualified to serve. Just you, you've heard her name. So I guess she gets to take it just. Like there's no respect for the process. There's no there's no expectation. There's no standards for the people that will will elect. She's had a couple of years now to prove that she deserves a spot in Congress. She hasn't delivered. And by the way, she's already promising her new area that she's not going. What is she talking about? I'm going to defeat the socialists and the communists. Oh, vague nonsense, conspiratorial nonsense that has nothing to do with. You could say that about literally any district. She's not making any promises that she's going to deliver for them. And she couldn't because she doesn't know anything about the district. It's just, <laughs> it is so disrespectful to the people. And so I don't even expect that a Democrat's going to win that race. So yeah. they're going to get some moron Republican, but shouldn't the Republicans there expect the best moron? Like just to get someone who's fleeing purely for their own political benefit. So these seats are supposed to be worth something. And she clearly doesn't think that they are, except to her. Now, with that said, we do need to move on. Or do you have a quick comment? I just wanted to say it's always the trigger words: dark money, Congress, uh, communists, socialists. It's always the trigger words for the people who get upset when they see this because. They don't have the benefit of the education that allows them to understand what communism means, what socialism really means, how we have a mixed economy, how we dabble in socialism when it benefits us, how we 
turn our faces against it, when it's something that's going to uh, crack the bank for these rich politicians who don't want to stop sending their kids to better schools than the rest of the people in the country. It is yeah. so amazing to me. It's always using the words that make people, oh, oh no, that's where I draw the line. And they don't even know what's really happening. It's so sad. Yeah. yeah I, and just there's just, there's no personal accountability. She says in her statement or whatever, this has been like a personally difficult year for me. Like the the issue isn't what you did in the theater. It isn't, it's that it is utterly inconsistent with the lofty moral position that you like to place yourself in from which you can persecute and suppress other people. And you have shown no evolution whatsoever on that. Maybe you'll be a little bit more careful about who you grope in public places, but you have not changed on your desire to attack other people for what they literally do behind closed doors. That's the issue. Anyway, we'll see what happens with her and if she does end up getting beaten, what she turns to. I'm assuming, I'm assuming podcast, maybe following George Santos with cameos or something. We'll perhaps find out together. Okay, really fast, let's give this quick update. DOJ prosecutors working for the special counsel are now pushing for his uh, Donald Trump's upcoming January 6th trial to feature some sort of bar on him making certain explicitly political non defenses of himself. They say in their filing that the special counsel has put forth in the last couple of weeks, the court should not permit the defendant to turn the courtroom into a forum in which he propagates irrelevant disinformation and should reject his attempts to inject politics into this proceeding. So basically, they're talking about a number of different things that he has already focused on in his public comments about this case that don't have anything to do with the actual charges. So things like him saying that this is being directed by the Biden administration, that this is simply designed not to punish him for what he has done in the past, but to stop him from becoming president in the future, those sorts of things. And they say, in addition to being wrong, these allegations are irrelevant to the jury's determination of the defendant's guilt or innocence, would be prejudicial if presented to the jury and must be excluded. They go on to talk about how he has often said that any involvement that he might have had with the January 6th insurrection is irrelevant. Because it wasn't a natural insurrection, law enforcement caused it. Or if they didn't cause it, they at least should have stopped it. And they didn't, so the blame's really on them, not on the person who inspired the insurrection. To which the special counsel says, a bank robber cannot defend himself by blaming the bank's security guard for failing to stop him. A fraud defendant cannot claim to the jury that his victim should have known better than to fall for his scheme. And the defendant cannot argue that law enforcement should have prevented the violence he caused and obstruction he intended. Basically saying in all of these cases, what he is going to try to do is get the jury to decide not based on the actual merits of the case or the evidence, but instead on political stuff sort of floating around it. And they're trying to stop that from being admissible in the court. I don't know Ida if they will be successful in this, we'll have to wait for a ruling from the judge. But what do you think about the fear that the special counsel seems to have that the the case is going to be full of these sorts of misinformation and distractions? <laughs> I mean, if they have a television, or the internet, then they know what's to come. Donald Trump yeah. is the circus. You know what I mean? That's Ringling Barlam Bailey right there in the flesh. Everywhere he goes, he turns something into a circus. He's learned, you know, how the media works in this country and he knows what to say so that he can get the cameras on him. And that's how he moves the people. So, I mean, the only way that they have any, I, I, in my opinion, and I don't know what I'm talking about, so I'm just going to say it. But the only way you get to have any semblance of order is to keep it private and nobody knows anything about what's going on in there. And that Donald Trump has to have someone sitting right next to him to monitor everything that comes out of his mouth <laughs> because <laughs> he's going to break the rules. That's what he's taught. You know, that's how he's trained the American people to respect him, the ones who do, who think he's he's the one that sticks it to the man. He says what needs to be said. He's not afraid to call it out. That is this, the culture that we've created in this country. Even if what he's saying is 100% untrue, he's yeah. sticking it to the man because he dares to say it out loud. And, and that is what we continue. You know, idiocracy is not just on the way is here. We we are in the midst of it. That's President Camacho, my friends. And what he <laughs> does is ridiculous everywhere he goes because he knows that there's a group of people that are going to say what I did to you 
earlier. Go Donald, go Donald. He has a whole yeah. a, a whole faction of the country believing that what he says is giving it to the man. And now facts are not facts are feelings. <laughs> And we are, you know, so good luck to that judge because yeah. the only way you can keep him from doing what he's doing is to keep a microphone away from him and a camera off of him. Yep. And even then, he'll still truth it. <laughs> anyway, uh, we'll be following it. We'll see. Uh, just a reminder, everyone, we have no idea how any of these cases are going to go. So stay focused on the election because he still could become president. With that said, we're going to take our second break of the hour, uh, but don't go anywhere. More to come. Okay, time is quickly running on this first hour. Uh, we want to jump into a couple more stories. So someone angered by the presence of books they don't like in a school went and anonymously complained to police in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, which led to, no lie, a cop going to the school to try to confiscate naughty books. Here's a little bit of the, uh, the body cam footage. I don't actually currently see it here, so. So it may I or may not you be out. Have you looked through the book yourself? Uh, I did read it back when it first came out. Yeah. So, but I don't really recall. So this is the issue. Okay. Um, it's, it's not the it's not the general idea of what the book's about. It's I can't present that kind of material to people under okay. eighteen. Um, so that's our concern, and um, that's why we're here. Yeah, it's a memoir about coming of age. I mean, you're welcome to remove it um, if you see it, but so, yeah, I, have I don't see it. it so could it be on it? It's possible yeah. that a teacher has it. A lot of teachers and other people have borrowed it as well. It's not something that is out for everybody, so it needs this is special approval only. So okay. As far as any of these other books, are there similar? Images that could be in any of them. Not that I know of. You're welcome to flip. <laughs> I'm not looking to flip through every single book here. Yeah, um, not that I know of. No, no. Okay, so look, the, the book is genderqueer. It has previously popped up in these sorts of stories with right wingers who have never ever, none of them have ever read the book, um, let alone actually thought about it or its place in art and literature. Uh, they wanna get rid of it because there's images that they don't like. Um, and so we have now gotten to a point where even in a state like Massachusetts, which is, you know, this is not Florida or whatever, uh, cops feel like it is their role to go to schools and try to track down books before kids can see it and thus be ruined. And it's important that they do that because as long as we get rid of these books, then kids will never see anything naughty. And then the kids will be kept pure and innocent until the end of time. So look, um, there, there's definitely an element here of uh, the teacher who is apparently LGBTQ sort of being persecuted. They feel targeted in this particular way. That could definitely be a component of this. But Ida, just the general idea that a cop would ever go to a school to track down a book, it feels like something like Margaret Atwood would write rather than a reality that we would live out in America. Um, I was just thinking Gilead is upon us. You know, it's like we're battling it out between the handmaid's tale and idiocracy. That's where we are at this point in society, which is really sad. But the fact that police officers who are supposed to be solving crimes, protecting Americans, um, you know, making sure that the children at that school are safe, including those gender queer kids that may be reading those books so that they can see a, a, a version of themselves in it because they deserve to be seen as well. That teacher should feel safe. And the fact that they are, you know, and, and uh, just the self-appointed terrorizers upon the people in this country. Every time uh, we hear these stories about what police officers are doing with their time instead of and then you hear the politicians talking about the crime rate, which has actually gone down. But you hear them talking about the mm -hmm. crime rate. And then you turn the cameras to the people who are supposed to be solving the crimes, protecting people from the crimes. They are the school making sure you don't read a book about stuff you can see on the internet, the stuff you can see at home that you're streaming on Netflix. It is just, uh, just, we are just in the upside down. Let me bring in another reference. Let's bring in Stranger <laughs> Things because absolutely we are living in an alternate reality because it doesn't make any sense 
that, you know, law enforcement would be used to in to enforce a book ban. You know, it just makes it makes no sense, John. You know that it's ridiculous. And we are sitting here watching it happen and we can't do anything about it. And it's really frustrating. And I know Americans who are really uh, dialed in and know what's happening, who are concerned about their American dollars, where they're paying their taxes and what they're getting out of it, have to feel cheated at every turn. Yeah. Yeah. Look, look, obviously, as we've talked about many times, this you cannot separate the the drive for censorship among these new parents rights people from um, wanting to effectively annihilate LGBTQ culture. Um, and, and also often like black writers are also caught up in this. Sometimes there's intersection between that. They're trying to destroy art that they have never had any interest in, have never explored. Um, but then also just, just on the literacy alone, like, can you imagine if they put half of their energy into trying to get kids to read other books even? Like, we actually have a literacy crisis. There's like really interesting new studies that have come out even just in the past month about how bad literacy is in America. And the, the chief passion when it comes to parents and books seemingly is in trying to root out the naughty ones. Which again, as I just said, you can find way worse stuff on the iPad that your that your parents gave you and plopped you down in front of for three hours. It is not difficult. Like maybe inspire kids to be curious so that someday they can have a little bit more open-minded like view of the world than clearly so many American parents do these days. This is yeah. just this is dystopic. Like this is not sustainable. We have we have ended up in a really dark place and and it is it is benefiting certain people. There are very wealthy interests that desperately want all of us to be wrestling in the mud over graphic memoirs while they continue to to get away with economic murder at the top. I just want now, to say quick, I just wanted continue. to say uh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to say quickly as a parent, you know, I mean, I think and as an author, you know, the the sad reality that I was told by one of the publishers that the average American reads at the sixth grade level. When you say liter literacy crisis and you put um, you put that that reality out. Now, I, I can't say that it is actual fact, but this came from one of the major publishers. You know, you think about the fact that they are trying to ban books. Um, and I just wrote a book and some people call my book problematic because of some of the graphic nature in the book, which is some of the stuff that actually happened to me in real life. But um, I, I just think that it's really sad um, when you think about the fact that people are not getting information. Um, the They used to say, I remember my old, my old one of my teachers told me, they used to say, if you want to keep a secret from a black person, put it in a book. Because during slavery, it was illegal for black people to know how to read. And so you think about how precious it is and, and, and how people have had to fight to have this right. And now people are throwing it away. The, the, the truth of this is, is that there's always been a, an attack on us. There's always been an attack on black people and people of color in this country. And they just continue to find different avenues to do it. You do yourself a great disservice if you don't read the great Langston Hughes or Maya Angelou. If you don't understand who Elizabeth Allende is, like these people are, documenting the time and the people who are writing today will tell this story today and many of you will go out will be written in history unfavorably and it's going to be sad the way how dumb we're going to look in the future because this is definitely our yeah. dark ages definitely I'm definitely worried about that um one of the people documenting the now is Ida so legitimate kid everybody go <laughs> check it out get a copy before the cops take them all by the way but yeah, I I agree 100%. Like I and by the way, it's not like there's that there's no drive for literacy. Like for all the issues that a lot of people, you know, have with uh TikTok or whatever, there is book talk and that is encouraging yes. people to to read books. I don't necessarily always like the books that go viral on there, but at least yes. somebody is pushing for it and words have value. Clearly the right wing utterly despises books it doesn't want you to focus on them and then also as a side note one of the things it's like salt in the wound is they despise books they want to ban books they don't want kids to read or think critically and then their think tanks buy up books by the tens of thousands written 
written by right wingers who didn't actually write it and won't actually be read so that they can create best sellers out of conservatives, which is the ultimate insult to injury. But anyway, it's a topic we're gonna continue to focus on. We're unfortunately out of time in the first hour. More to come in the aftermath, don't go anywhere.